morning dear friends and welcome to this module in the previous module we had traced the evolution of digital literary practices and analyzed various examples like hypertext literature these digital writing projects as we saw are inclined more towards a user defined embodied and interactive process that can dynamically reshape the reading experience today we shall focus on key developments related with digital narrative practices and new media fiction we will see what is new about these storytelling modes to further understand textuality and digital communication we will particularly refer to cybernetic writing new media fiction cyber fiction and cyberpunk narratives the impact of digital textuality on narratives has redefined how we create consume and think about the written content and this brings us to the concept of cyber texts the first thing to remember is that the cyber text is not a revolutionary form of text with capabilities made possible only through the intervention of the digital computer it is also not a radical break with old fashioned technology as arseth has commented cyber text is a perspective on all forms of textuality a way to expand the scope of writing and literary studies to include phenomena that today are perceived as outside of or marginalized by the field of literary writing Espen Arseth had coined the term cyber text in his 1997 work Cyber Text Perspectives on Ergodic Literature. He had also coined the word ergodic which refers to any kind of literature that requires a special effort to navigate and digest. The term is derived from the Greek words ergon which means work and hodos which means path. Arseth's coinage of the term cyber text refers to a wide range of possible textualities where the functional capabilities of cybernetics play a defining role in determining the aesthetic process. Cyber text shifts the focus from the dyadic or the dichotomy of author sender and reader receiver to an information feedback loop of transmedial and multimodal reading. governed by cybernetic interaction among the reader the text in the hypermedium it reduces the intentional powers of human operator and makes them part of a text driven digital performance digital forms of creative writing are not an imitation or a mockery of the traditional print text or author we are dealing with what can be termed as cyborg literature produced by a combination of human and technological activities a cyborg textuality would question the relevance of author text and reader and does not marginalize the positions of the text and the reader for the author instead of trying to create a surrogate author we have to see the computer and other modes of technology as literary agents that point towards dialogic forms of improvisation and free play between the user and the interface arseth has talked about three positions of human machine collaboration in the study of cyborg literature and they are pre processing co processing and post processing pre processing suggests when the machine is programmed configured and loaded by the human Co-processing suggests when the machine and the human produce text in tandem together. Post-processing is in which the human selects some of the machine's effusions and excludes others. Here we have shown certain clippings of Woody Allen's 1993 film Manhattan Murder Mystery, which makes use of pre-processing and co-processing effectively. The cyborg authorship does not mean that the author has given up control as we have seen from Woody Allen's film the response from the machine is beyond the control of its author 
who can only hope that the machine follows a very linear narration. But the naive user gets manipulated in new and interesting ways. And that is when we talk about digital narratives. We cannot separate the text and the reader. Our body is doubly situated within the narrative. The user readers are embodied as direct receivers whose bodies interact with the hardware and software of the computer. They are also re-embodied through the feedback they experience in represented forms such as through visible or invisible avatars. We will take the example of a physio cyber textual crime fiction called The Breathing Wall by Kate Pullinger and Stephen Schimert to understand how multimodal reading is governed by corporeal politics. The Breathing Wall corresponds to Catherine Heil's concept of a post-human world which sees the body as a prosthetic that we can manipulate. The implied reader creates an augmented sense of corporeality that shows how semiotic resources are combined multimodally to form a multisensory artifact. Thus, the narrative experience is a blend of multimodal techniques and bodily interactive elements. This integration of traditional narration with physiological and cybernetic analysis is termed as cybersomatic. The Breathing Wall is a physical cyber text crime fiction that responds to the reader's rate of breathing using a design software called Hypertransfiction Matrix. The gothic effect of the story is amplified through the physical immersion in the narrative cybernetic matrix. It is the implied reader itself that assumes the role of the private eye of the protagonist. The advent of new media fiction has also pushed the boundaries of traditional narrative forms and explores the intersections of literature and technology. We will look at two works at this point. One is the 2002 novel by Steve Tomsula, Was an Opera in Flatland, and the other is Mark Daniel Lewski's 2006 novel, Only Revolutions. Was primarily focuses on the relationship between textuality of the body and the materiality of the text, that is, the difficulty of distinguishing between court and the world. Vas is, largely the Vas is largely the exploration of the post-human body in which bodies have become manipulable and are rewritable as texts and this shows the impact of new information technologies on the way literature can be produced now. Quotes that constitute the book gradually become indistinguishable from the quotes that constitute actual living matter. The form of the novel is made possible by the development of new publishing software. It also contains a wide variety of technical images that could be compiled and distributed through photocopying, microfilm and the internet. Similarly, Daniel Lewski's iBook edition of Only Revolutions affords the reader a view of the transformative opportunities embedded in a digitally democratic text and the new possibilities of the digital medium. Contemporary narratives democratize textual parts by giving equal importance to the separate elements of the narrative development. Hyperlinking and music provide a multi-tiered readerly experience that shifts authority and souls. So, the book functions like digital media and is fashioned to perform like a computer. Dina Lewiski also lists different historical moments in what he calls as chronomosaic. However, the two characters across time and space are joined together in the story content as well as in the layout of the pages. The reader can reorient between the two narratives by clicking on the central page tile. Daniel Whiskey inscribes the divisions onto the pages from parallel channels. Each voice retains individual characteristics but also equally contributes to forming the whole. 
the anxiety that technology poses a specific threat to or competes with something human has been articulated by artists and critics since the industrial revolution. In today's digital age, we are forced to address the notion that not only humans but also the creative writing they produce in the language they use may be nothing more than a machine interface. And these writings focus on the cybernetic society and disruptions of pre-established patterns of behavior that maximizes the fungibility or interchangeability of futures. The specific form of writing that addresses this concept of postmodern thought is termed as cybernetic fiction. This form of writing has become important for our study because it shows the strategic consequences of communications in the future. Cybernetic fiction is a subgenre of postmodernistic fiction that imitates or purports to be machines or are structured like highly polished and integrated mechanical devices. They anticipate the effacement of the discontinuity between man and machine and narrate against technological determinism. The term implied reader was introduced by literary theorist Wolfgang Eiser to address the kind of a reader that a text assumes or suggests. Cybernetic fiction constructs the notion of implied reader through the non-linear storytelling. Readers potentially navigate the text in different ways, creating their own paths and interpretations. Implied reader is a concept of a textual structure, anticipating the presence of a recipient without necessarily defining one. The cybernetic postmodern fiction is a playful treachery in the sense that it may look like a machine or talk about the mechanized man himself, but it functions as something more than a machine, something inexplicable by assimilating a flesh and technology as well as human interactions with machines. It shows how cyborg communication is formed. Let us further try to understand the concept through some of the major works of cyber fiction. We would refer to J. G. Ballard's 1973 novel, Crash. It reveals the destiny of the human body in a world wired by cybernetics and catastrophe. That is a crash body or an ungodly offspring of technology and science. Crash pursues the image of one its narrative alpha and omega. Technologies of photography become the condition of all that one does and is in terms of voyeurism and hyperreal representations. Automobile is also seen as a condition of agency in the cybernetic society. The body becomes the prosthesis of the automobile and a surface in relation to it. One has used photographic representation of Elizabeth Taylor also to rearrange it so that it can assimilate the textbook wounds of other bodies. We can say that crash represents the cybernetic postmodern society as disembodied without any effect or a semiotics without any meaning. It is a strange fact of cyber fiction that it has explored the intersection between homosexuality and technoscience. We would also refer to William Burrow and Samuel Delany, two authors that assimilate queer sexuality to technoscience. Let us see how a sexualized cyber fiction becomes the erotic software of cybernetic society. Burrow and Delany turn to queer spaces where the body mutates under new conditions and turns sexuality into a means of bodily transformation, not reproduction. For both these authors, the creation of privacy, reproduction and consent remain a slave to forces that determine its agencies, sexual or otherwise. Dilani has used the word women to refer to all humans in his work. And this disturbs normative assumptions about gendered agency 
and sexual identities even within the digital sphere. Burroughs' trilogy deconstructs the autonomous heterosexual body as a host body under siege by an array of incompatible life forms like viruses. Delaney's work talks about creating new bodies and experiencing new forms of life and sex. The gay protagonist Gorga's planet explodes, leaving him as its sole survivor. Both these writers refuse subordination and its masochistic pleasures, and in this sense, queer science advances new sexualities for cybernetic society. Cyber fiction often posits fantasies of technological triumph over female flesh. All this changes when women start writing cyber fiction. Genetics and bioengineering take the cybernetic turn for the insurgence of reproductive female body against its masters. The best sci-fi practitioner who puts the concept at the center of her work is Octavia Butler. In Octavia Butler's famous trilogy, sexual reproduction gives way to genetic hybridization. Through an alien species, Butler reenacts one of the darkest aspects of the slave economy, its reduction of the body, specifically the female body, to its reproductive capacity. So Butler posits a future where the reproduction of flesh becomes a creative process. And she views culture and the human tendency to make it the condition of identity as an obstacle to the kind of change she calls xenogenesis. She imagines a post-cultural future in which identity is flesh and life is change. What Butler tries to do here is to view change as something that occurs physically, which is to say at the level of living flesh, so that identity will not be restricted to cultural politics. The important point to consider here is that alternatives to conventional modalities of human existence are there as well. That is subjectivities that radically define the nature of humanity and the nature of self. Let us look at this concept further by analyzing a contemporary fiction, Vega the Intergalactic Warrior by an Indian author Priyamvada Gaur. Vega the Intergalactic Warrior, published in 2023, is about an orphan young intergalactic warrior set in the multiverse of Andariksha. The novel extrapolates the micropolitics in parallel worlds and demonstrates the construction as well as deconstruction of the feminist subject in a technologically influenced post-human world. It warns against the limitations, socio-cultural realities and ideological systems inherent in any vision of a post-apocalyptic future. It also asks vital questions about family, love and freedom and how they stack up when the profiteers of war take the earth as well as the multiverse Antariksha towards annihilation. Here again we deconstruct human and more than human opposition and begin to ask new questions about the ways in which humans and more than humans mutually evolve. When we talk about Vega or any other cybernetic novel placed in a cultural context, it becomes difficult to place it in familiar space or a time period. Does multiverse represent a place in which our future present day might look? Yes. But does it represent a utopia or a real time period now? No. In a state, these forms of speculative fiction fall within the realm of Acronian texts. So what is the concept of Acronia? Acronia is our present day world in a fictional time period. The framework of Acronia expands the temporal frame to include the future. It also suggests a no time and a representation of Earth's future and an uncertain tomorrow due to the culmination of present-day actions. Vega can be termed as a blend of dystopia and acronia as it presents an alternate kind and conditions of life 
in a different fictional time. It shows a teleological progression of today's behavior in a world that has changed sometime in the future precisely due to same human actions. So why do cybernetic texts suggest a no time rather than a no place in a dystopian universe? It is because that they show that the same place might look different in a different time. Further details of the novel Vega are provided in the reference section. Contemporary cyber culture and certain cyborg performances contain the actualization of new experiences of bodies with the spread of the electronic environment. Let us try to understand this change of the body view in cyberspace and cyber culture, re-examining the infinite possibilities for interpreting the body. All of us are familiar with Gibson's Neuromancer, which had presented the imagery of cyberspace as a techno fantasy. Contemporary cyber culture has evolved to show how we grasp the experience of bodies through technologies and digital performances. Media theorist Rosanna Stone conceives bodies in cyberspace not to be free from physical bodies. The body representatives in cyberspace, in her view, have consensual interactive and haptic experiences and become reconstructed bodies that permeate the social, biological and the technological. Artist and theorist Monica Fleischmann discusses how the body interacts with technologies or environment and uses digital interfaces as a playful interaction of bodies, art and technology in opposition to the theory of disappearing body in cyberspace. Thus, the reconstructed bodies in cyberspace have both material and virtual dimensions. They gain a sense of presence and agency through the interface and avatar. Let us take an example from popular culture. The 1919 movie Matrix, directed by Lana and Lily Wachowski, is a cinematic representation of pushing our bodily limits to the edge of virtuality and cyberspace. The film describes a future in which reality perceived by humans is actually the matrix, a hyper-reality created by sentient machines in order to pacify and subdue the human population. These sentient machines called agents patrol within the matrix simulation and eradicate any doubts as to the reality to the virtual lives of its subjects. The protagonist is a hacker who becomes post-human through his entry and embodiment inside the cyberspace of the matrix. The film supplements Jean Baudrillard's concept of hyper-reality and simulation in which the medium has vanished and fiction has overtaken reality by fully virtualizing the body. For Neo, the only escape from the machinic virtual reality of the matrix is by becoming more virtual than the screen. A body large instance would suggest that the post-humor has already happened and it is now merely a matter of imagining it. Then again, the question of what to do with the materiality and physicality of the body comes. Let us look at the performance art of Still Arc, an artist who explores the possibilities of redesigning the body into a cyborg through an interface of human and the virtual. Still Arc's performance interrogates the symbiotic relationship between humans and technology body data and computer generated information. Stellark's body becomes a prosthetic moved by an artificial external stimulus on exoskeleton. Both the human and the virtual body have input into the operational behavior of one another. So the body functions as a liminal interface between technologies and it illustrates not an artist's design but rather a virtual entity's desired movement that Stellark refers to as whims of the avatar. This is a state of human not human 
where the physical self and virtual self are in a continuous feedback loop. Let us now look at an art performance of Stellar where he performs his concept of walking machine, exoskeleton, at the STRP Biennial at Eindhoven in the Netherlands. <laughs> I guess it's a general curiosity about what's possible, what's plausible, uh, what pushes the boundaries. So uh, determining, for example, the psychological and physiological parameters of the body, or how one can augment the physical body, the biological body with prosthetic attachments or robotic extensions, or using instruments that enhance your sensory apparatus. That's the kind of approach that, that this particular artist takes. You know, we're increasingly expected to perform in mixed realities. We're still biological bodies, but increasingly we're accelerated by our machines, we're enhanced by our instruments, our computational capabilities are amplified with new technologies. So the body can be seen as a construct of meat, metal, and code. <laughs> <laughs> This performance that we see in the video is a cybernetic prototype in a multimedia performance event. The performance nucleus lies in the code of digital entity that lies in the avatar and its movements, which are then moving stellar. The virtual interchangeability of humans and machines is a recurring theme in cyberpunk and intrinsic to its representation of cyborgs. Cyberpunk is a genre that couches the ambiguity of cybernetics by representing the conflicts and contradictions in cyberculture. So cyberpunk can be described as a postmodern literary cultural style that projects a computerized future. The multi-accentuality of cyberpunk is paralleled by the related phenomena of cyberspace and virtual realities. So, the cyberpunk narratives create a hypertext body constructed via technology and it also deconstructs the opposition between wired and organic corporeality. It foregrounds virtual technologies as decentering space and identities and forming cybernetic communities that either lead to emancipation or perpetuation of hierarchical structures of the society. What we have to understand about cyberpunk narratives is that it conceives the body as a very fluid entity, that is, as an ever-changing product of technology and cultural contexts. The cyberpunk body can be a personality construct or even a commodity, that is, it becomes hypervisible. We will discuss in detail the hypervisibility of bodies when we talk about cybernetic sexual modalities and gendered subjects in the coming weeks. Let us also briefly discuss one of the most intriguing areas of cyber literature that is fan fiction. Fan fiction combines popular culture and literature in a unique symbiotic relationship. 
It signifies texts mainly created as pseudo sequels to a book or a comic strip or a TV series or film and that are not written by professional authors but by fans only. Fan fiction forms a cyber community where members interact only in written form and the reader communicates only with the pure creation of the text. It is an extreme manifestation of the post-modernist concept of the death of the author as the traditional role of readers has changed and they directly interfere in the writing process with their comments. Real person fake is a unique type of fan fiction written by fans of public personalities, pop or rock groups. This can be seen either as a form of hyper-reality where characters are replaced by a simulacra of their representations in fan fictions. In fan fiction, the author's own interference as a character sometimes makes the manipulation with reality even more intense. Cybernetic writing and its offshoots signify a compelling step forward in the evolution of literary art promising a future where the written word coexist harmoniously with the infinite possibilities of technology. The exploration of cybernetic writing, new media fiction and cyber fiction presents a fascinating intersection of literature and technology that reshapes traditional storytelling paradigms. As the digital age continues to evolve, the boundaries between reality and fiction become increasingly blurred, inviting us to question the nature of identity, communication and the very essence of storytelling itself. The dynamic integration of multimedia elements, interactive structures and complex narratives characterizes this evolving landscape, offering readers and creators alike a unique and immersive experience. These forms of narrative expression not only challenge our understanding of literature, but also redefine the ways in which we engage with stories. In the next module, we will be talking about digital communication in the contested realm of digital scholarship, publishing, access and digital materiality. We will also have a look at how we can sort out the digital humanities in the contemporary era of digital communication. Thank you.